The title for tonight's lecture has stimulated a good bit of uh, interest and uh, some fun with people writing all kinds of things, clever things on the posters. Uh, did God have a wife uh, or a son, a uh, uh, husband? Will there be photos? Um, to introduce our distinguished archaeologist who will answer all these questions <laughs> and provide photos, uh, I give you Dr. Laura Mazo from our anthropology faculty and our anthropologist herself who teaches courses uh, in our religion program, very valuable uh, adjunct faculty for our program. I have both the pleasure and honor this evening of introducing to you tonight's speaker, William Deaver. Bill Deaver earned a BA in religion from Milligan College, a BD in Hebrew and Greek from Christian Theological Seminary, an MA in Semitics from Butler University, and a PhD in Syro-Palestinian Archaeology from Harvard University. He is currently Professor Emeritus at the University of Arizona and Distinguished Visiting Professor um, at Lycoming College in Pennsylvania. Professor Deaver has had a long and illustrious career in Near Eastern and Biblical Archaeology, and it is much to his credit that the fields of Biblical Archaeology can be considered a serious academic discipline with a rigorous methodological and theoretical basis. He has directed archaeological excavations in Israel and the West Bank for close to five decades and is the principal advisor to numerous excavations and publication projects in Israel. He has authored more than 25 books and hundreds of articles. His most recent books include What Did the Biblical Writers Know and When Did They Know It? Archaeology and the, and the Reality of Ancient Israel. Who Were the Israelites and Where Did They Come From? And Did God Have a Wife? Archaeology and Folk Religion in Ancient Israel, which is the title of tonight's talk. So, without further ado, I am honored to turn the lectern over to Bill Deaver. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm honored to give the 16th Annual Jarvis Lecture. I'm especially honored because the invitation comes partly from Dr. Mazzo, who is one of my own 26 doctoral students. Uh, I'm inordinately proud of all of them, uh, particularly of Laura. She comes with a wealth of field experience, um, with a wonderful dissertation soon to be published, uh, and uh, with vast experience in teaching. In, in 27 years at Arizona, she was by far the best TA I ever had. I don't know how lucky you are to have her here. There are very few universities, only a handful in North America, who are privileged to have on their faculty a full-time professional biblical archaeologist. You're in that select group, so I hope you continue to support her in her burgeoning career. Tonight I want to talk about what I shall call folk religion, sometimes called popular religion in ancient Israel, and I want to contrast that with what we might call book religion, or the orthodox version that we have in the Hebrew Bible as it now comes into our hands. Now, in theory, it ought to be very easy to draw a portrait of ancient Israelite religion. You just pick up the Bible and read it. It's all about religion, obsessed with the subject almost. But if you think about it for a moment, the Bible is not actually a very good source for these reasons. First of all, the stories in the Bible are written sometimes long centuries after the events they purport to describe. Not only that, worse still, the Bible is written by a handful of elites in Jerusalem, intellectuals who were greatly out of touch with the reality of life in ancient Israel. The Bible is not about the beliefs and practices of ordinary people. That's where archaeology comes into the picture. What you have in the Hebrew Bible is a highly idealistic portrait of what the religion of Israel ought to have been like and would have been like, like were these fellows in charge, but they never were. They were a minority. The Bible is, in fact, as one of my theologian colleagues, and I have some, uh, says, a minority report, a minority report. 
That's where archaeology comes in. So I want to try to describe for you tonight what the reality of religious life was really like in ancient Israel, drawing my data largely from archaeological discoveries. Now, some of this will be a little unsettling, I must warn you, because archaeology doesn't easily confirm the picture most of us have of the reality of life in ancient Israel. It gives us a different view of looking at things. In particular, I want to raise the question of whether most early Israelites were monotheist at all, whether Yahweh, the God of ancient Israel, might not have had a companion, as uh, the male deities generally in the ancient world did. And I want to warn you that I'm not going to make a value judgment. I'm not going to tell you uh, which view is right, uh, what is actually orthodox, what you should believe in practice. I'm trying to describe the reality, only that. So bear with us. Be patient. We're going to look at a lot of material in a short time. I want to move generally from north to south and from earlier periods to later periods. Uh, bear in mind that if I use the word Palestinian to describe ancient things, uh, I have no modern context for it at all. Just put that out of your mind for the moment. So um, hold on. Here we go. Let's have the first slide, please. If you have questions and want to hold them to the end, uh, we'll try to allow some time for a discussion. I'm sorry not to use PowerPoint. I know that that's the modern thing to do, but I am not a modern person. <laughs> we always say uh, archaeologists love only old things, so marry an archaeologist. He'll love you more as you get older. <laughs> We're going to look at ancient Israel. That is primarily the territory of the modern state of Israel, plus the West Bank, seen here in a typical photograph from a biblical atlas. Next. Let's begin to tell Dan on the northern border of Israel, which in the 10th and 9th centuries BC was the cultural capital, at least, of the northern kingdom. Here you see the reconstructed city wall of about the 9th century BC. Next. Here is a plan of the city gate, a typical triple entryway city gate of the Iron Age or the Israelite period. Uh, in the ancient towns, life revolved around the city gate. People came and went there, commerce was carried on, uh, the village tribunal met there. Uh, so let's look for a moment at what the gate area of Tel Dan can tell us about religious life. Next. In the outer court of the gate, you find a low stone altar with five small standing stones behind it. Now, the standing stones are what the Hebrew Bible calls matzevot. And these are stones set up to commemorate the appearance of a deity. Uh, and, of course, altars are mentioned everywhere in the Hebrew Bible, so we would not be surprised to find a, a gate shrine at a northern Israelite site, except for the fact that in the Hebrew Bible, all worship, ideally, is centralized in Jerusalem under the administration of the official priests. So what is this doing here? It shouldn't be here. So I want, from the very beginning, to show you the disconnect between some of the artifacts we have and the official story of things in the Hebrew Bible. So uh, this is kosher in a way, but it shouldn't be here outside of Jerusalem. Next. As we move into the main part of the town, we find some other artifacts. Here is a small four-horned altar. Now, horned altars are described in the Hebrew Bible, but they're apparently monumental things, perhaps six feet square in the cities of refuge. You can go there and hold on to the horns of the altar for refuge. But these are little things. Uh, somebody could pick you up altar and all and carry you away. So here is not the kind of altar the biblical writers are talking about, another kind of disconnect. These were used for incense. Incense is okay, but again, it, only in the official cult in Jerusalem. Next. Now, here is a large horn of an altar. The rest of it is not present, and that seems to be what the Bible is talking about. Interestingly enough, we've, had, we've only found two of these, one at Dan and one at Beersheba. And in the Bible, those are the borders, northern and southern borders of Israel. So here we do have something that fits the biblical description. Next. Here you see the one at Beersheba, and you can see something of the size. So already from the beginning, we see that part of what we find does fit in with a biblical portrait of Israelite religion, but part of it doesn't, and it's the difference we have to look at. Next. Here at Dan, there is a large outdoor installation approached by a flight of steps. Uh, it looks like the foundation, perhaps, and the steps of an ancient temple, but it's something rather different. Next. Here's an artist's reconstruction of it. This is what the Hebrew Bible calls a bama, or a high place. Now, these are always condemned because they're connected with Canaanite religion. This is probably the very one mentioned in the Book of Kings, which is, of course, condemned by the biblical writers, because Canaanite rites of sacrifice went on here that were repugnant to the writers of the Bible. 
One could argue this is Canaanite, but it's not. It's Israelite. It belongs to the 9th century when Tel Dan was a part of the northern kingdom of Israel. Next. Among the other things found at Tel Dan was a small three-roomed building adjacent to the Bama, the high place we just saw. And here you see that building. Next. The three rooms are reminiscent of the Jerusalem temple. It was also a three-room structure. This dates from just after the time of Solomon, probably to the 9th century or so. And here you see the plan of the building. So it looks like a miniature of the Jerusalem temple. But there was only one legitimate temple, and that was the one in Jerusalem. Next. Next to the building, in fact, in one of the rooms, is a low altar, stone altar, and then a broken store jar set into the dirt floor. Uh, and, of course, animal sacrifices would be offered here. And then shovels, which are described in the Bible as part of the temple furnishings, would be used to clean away the altar. And next, the shovels were also found here. So, again, this fits the biblical description, but it's in the wrong place and under the wrong supervision. Next. In the temple precinct at Dan was found also an olive pressing installation. You might wonder what that was for. But, of course, olive oil was used to anoint the beard. It was used in various cultic activities and ritual activities. Uh, but we must suppose that the priests here at Tel Dan were not legitimate priests. They were not part of the Aaronite priesthood in Jerusalem. So we have a full-fledged temple with all of its furnishings and paraphernalia here at an Israelite site that flies in the face of everything that the biblical writers uh, recommend. Next. Now we also know there was a copper or bronze working installation in the temple precincts and here is a small bronze scepter uh, that was probably on a wooden shaft carried by some priest at the site. Once again, there should not be any such priests here. Next. Now, let's look at figurines. According to the first and second commandments, there is only one God, a male deity, and you're not to make any representation of him whatsoever. So Israelite religion is supposed to be an iconic. It does not have any icons. Uh, here, however, we have a female uh, figure, and this is not an ordinary person, uh, but probably a female deity. So keep in mind the question of what these figurines mean, because we're going to come back to them. Now, you might say, well, it would be all right to make a portrait of some female deity, but surely not the male deity, Yahweh. You would never find uh, images of a male deity at an Israelite site. Next. Oh, yes, you would. <laughs> um, and furthermore, this one is Phoenician in style. Now, remember in the Hebrew Bible, the kings in the north, every single one of them are condemned by the southern writers of the Bible because they're, they're Phoenician, uh, Ahab being the worst villain, of course. So uh, you could say that much of this court, uh, cult in the north is really Phoenician, but, it, but it's not. It's Israelite. It borrows from Canaanite and Phoenician motifs. So here we have male figurines, but I will say they're very rare. We have hundreds, perhaps thousands of female figurines, very few male figurines. Next. Now, I want to say beyond, before we move on, if you look at 2 Kings 23 and the description of the reforms of Josiah, what Josiah tried to do, uh, in Judah at least, was to get rid of all this pagan stuff, throw it out. Um, but the, the fact is, it really did exist. So it's not so surprising to find things of which the biblical writers disapprove. And in fact, I'm going to say something now that will shock you. Much of the real religion of ancient Israel consisted of exactly all those things the Bible prohibits. Why prohibit it? Because that's what people were doing. In other words, the prophets and the reformers knew what they were talking about. It was bad out there. And, and uh, so keep in mind that archaeology provides a real-life context for the late reformers in their attempts to purge the cult of all these so-called pagan influences. Next. Uh, here's the three entryway gate at another site in the north, Tel Farah, which is probably biblical Tirzah, the first actual capital of the northern kingdom after the death of Solomon in the civil war that divided the country. So we have another gate shrine at another Israelite site of the 10th, 9th century. And the French excavators published these figurines. Look at the one in the top in the center, number two, a half-nude female figure clutching something to the left breast, which many scholars think is a tambourine or a frame drum. I don't think so. I think it's a molded cake. Now, in uh, Jeremiah, you have a wonderful description of popular religion, folk religion. Jeremiah complains that the children gather kindling and the men build fires and the women bake cakes for the queen of heaven. 
Who is the queen of heaven? And what are Israelite and Judean women doing worshiping her? Well, we have bowls for making these cakes, and I suspect that what we have are cakes made for the queen of heaven. So keep in mind, who is she? You might notice the other figurines are typically also a female figure, sometimes pregnant, sometimes nursing, as the one in the lower left. These are often called fertility figurines because it's assumed they have something to do with magic rites to ensure conception and safe childbirth, the ability to nurse a child and raise it. And so we're dealing perhaps with the mother goddess, the ancient mother goddess. But again, this is an Israelite site, despite these figurines of Canaanite style. Next. Now, one of the finds at Tel Farah was a small terracotta model temple called Anaos. Somebody here already had the current issue of the BAR, which has an article uh, which I've written there on these shrines. Biblical scholars haven't paid much attention to them until very recently, but they are really houses. Now, in all the West Semitic languages, the word for house and temple is the same. A temple is just the house of the deity. She's not at home today, but she has been. Notice the trees that form the columns. Uh, notice you don't have too many palm trees here. I didn't see many, but in Tucson we have lots. And these are palm trees, take my word for it. Now look at the top, you have the crescent moon and you have the stars of the Pleiades. And these are symbols of these heavenly deities, particularly the old Canaanite mother goddess Asherah. Keep her name in mind because you're going to meet her again and again. So we connect these house shrines with the goddess Asherah. The question is, of course, what are these customs still doing surviving in ancient Israel? Next. Here is one of these naoi, or shrines, and here again you see the palm trees with the double volutes. And then notice at the top is a dove perched on the lintel. The dove is the symbol of the Phoenician goddess Tanit, who is a later version of Canaanite Israelite Asherah. So the mother goddess persisted for centuries and centuries and centuries in the ancient world. And it should not surprise us that she was sometimes venerated in ancient Israel too as the consort of the male deity. Next. Here is one just recently published. In fact, it's the one in the bar article. And if you notice in the back, there is a seat, but it's a double throne. So there must have been a pair of deities at one time. Now remember, everywhere else in the ancient world, deities were paired, male and a female deity. Everywhere, and I'm going to suggest that was also the conception in Israel of many ordinary people. So already we suspect that there, there was more than one God. Remember the Hebrew Bible talks about Baal or Baal everywhere. There are 40 references at least to Asherah, the old Canaanite mother goddess, and there are shadowy references even to other deities. And remember, when it says, you shall have no other gods before me, it means you could have, but don't. Don't do it. Don't, don't put them in my face. That's sort of what the Hebrew text says. Don't throw them up to me. They exist, but they're not real. They're not powerful. So the writers of the Bible are already aware of the possibility of other gods existing alongside the god they preferred. Next. Here is a very important Naos uh, temple shrine from Idalian, the site in Cyprus where my wife directs excavations. This is now in the Louvre. And notice again the tree columns, the clear story windows at the top. And if you notice here, the lady is at home. She's standing in the doorway, quite naked. And in case you miss her there, which is kind of hard, uh, she's looking out the window. A slow Friday night, she's drumming up a little business. Come, come into my house and let's talk. So uh, the goddess is at home very often. And uh, her absence in the doorway of the earlier shrines doesn't mean anything because these shrines are connected with Asherah. When we find them at an Israelite site, we have to think of Asherah. Next. Now here's one from Cyprus also, and notice the goddess. She has a kind of bouffant wig. Wherever you see her in that wig, she represents Hathor, the Egyptian version of Canaanite Asherah. So we know who she is, and then, just in case you don't get the point, she's wearing a naos on her head, like a hat. And if you look in the doorway of the one up there, there she is again. So she's everywhere. She's everywhere. Next. Now, let's turn to a third site in the south. Tanakh, a sister site of Megiddo in the southern reaches of the Jezreel Valley, and we shall not be surprised to find another monumental oil press here. Next. Not very far away, there was found a small village shrine. Now, I want to suggest that for most people in ancient Israel, this focus of religious life was not the temple in Jerusalem. They had never been there in their whole lifetime. A difficult and dangerous uh, 
uh, journey. When you got there, you couldn't get in the temple anyway. It was a royal chapel, more or less. Even parts of it weren't open to the priests. So we're talking about the religion of hearth and home. And I suspect the principal religious official in ancient Israel was not the priest in Jerusalem, but, but the woman who headed the family. We're talking about family religion and family observances. Here's the best example we have of a village shrine, which probably served several families. And it dates to the 10th century, the very time the temple was being built in Jerusalem, the age of Solomon. Now, several things were found in this shrine. First of all, a bowl full of several dozen polished astragali, or sheep and goat knuckle bones. What in the world would, would bones be used for? And used so much they developed a patina, casting lots, divination, sorcery, exactly what's forbidden in the Hebrew Bible. But people were doing it in the popular cults. Not only that, there were other things found here as well. Next. Here is a modern cast made from a mold found in this little shrine. And uh, she's holding at the breast that same sort of object. She doesn't look too happy about it. But the point is, these figurines were so cheap you could mass produce them. Everybody had them, both men and women. They're everywhere. But here's the interesting thing. You can go through the Bible and sort out all the Hebrew terms for image or idol or that sort of thing. These are nowhere mentioned. We have maybe 3,000 of them, and the biblical writers never mention them once. Why? Because they don't want you to know about them. But I'm going to tell you anyway. So here they are. So who is she? Who is she? These, you see, are votives. Now, what is a votive? A votive is something that votes for you when you can't be there. So when you can't always be in church, you buy a candle and you leave the candle burning to pray for you, right? And that's what many scholars think these are. You couldn't always be in the presence of the goddess, but you could buy a little image of her and leave it to represent you. But whatever we are going to say, these female figurines clearly do have something to do with, with conception and with childbirth and with lactation. Next. Now, in this same village shrine was found the most remarkable piece of Israelite art ever discovered. This is a terracotta cult stand about three feet high, and it's obviously exotic. I'm not going to comment on all the scenes in the upper registers, except to say you see uh, various kinds of things, particularly in the third register down, a pair of winged lions, the biblical cherubim. I want you to look at the bottom register, look closely, and then we'll see a close-up of this scene next. Well, 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 who do we have here? A naked female holding two lions by the ears. It's a charming scene. But we have to ask, who is the lion lady? Who is the lion lady? Now, you can assume that some artist was just having fun, but I don't think so. These symbols are extremely powerful, and we have to try to understand what they mean. So let's ask, who is the lion lady? Again, the date, 10th century, the age of Solomon the very time when the temple is flourishing in Jerusalem under the aegis of the official priesthood. Next. Now, here is a bronze arrowhead found not very far from Jerusalem, near Bethlehem, and belonging to the period of the judges, about the 11th century B.C. Now, you all read Paleo-Hebrew, so let's read together now. At the top, Evid Labit, the servant of the lioness, or the lion lady. And then we turn the arrow over, and on the other side you have the man's name, Ben-Anat. Now, in the old Canaanite pantheon, the three lady goddesses are Asherah, Anat, and Astarte. So the importance of this is that here was a professional, uh, probably a mercenary, uh, who has the name of the goddess. He is the son of Anat, the mother goddess, and he is the servant of the lion lady. In other words, the patroness of this Israelite archer in the period of the judges is the Canaanite mother goddess Asherah. And here we have inscriptional evidence, which is hard to, hard to argue with. Next. Now, let's come briefly to Jerusalem, and you'll be surprised at how briefly, because I've just said it wasn't terribly important for, for most people. This is a good artist's notion of what Jerusalem would have looked like in the age of Solomon. You see the lower city to the left, and up above that the Temple Mount. Uh, but remember, the temple uh, was not a very large building. The city itself was not large, perhaps 2,000 people or more. So the center of Israelite religion in the Bible is always Jerusalem and the temple um, and, and the, the monarch on the throne, uh, Yahweh's uh, own son in some cases. But for most people, uh, the temple in Jerusalem was just not a part of their life. It represented them about as much as Washington inside the Beltway represents you. Next. 
Here's one artist's notion of what the temple looked like, but, but uh, that's, that's another lecture. Next. Now, one of the finds in Jerusalem made by Dame Kathleen Kenyon, uh, the great British archaeologist, was a hoard of objects, more than 400 found not 100 yards from the Temple Mount. And among the things she found were dozens and dozens of these same, pil uh, we call them Judean pillar-based figurines. Notice the lower body is not represented, uh, only the breast. Uh, the heads are broken off of almost all of them. Now, the date of this hoard is about 600 B.C., toward the end of the Judean monarchy, in the era uh, of, of King Josiah. And it's tempting to think that when Josiah cleansed the temple and threw out all of this stuff, he threw this stuff out too. That's not impossible. It's not impossible. So here we have a whole series of female figurines, including the one at the top with a large object. But the more typical ones we'll come back to later are the ones at the bottom. Now, William Foxwell Albright, the great uh, mentor of us all, uh, once called these Dea Nutrix figurines. In other words, he thought these were talisman used by women uh, for good luck. Remember how hazardous childbirth was in the ancient world, uh, literally a matter of life and death for child and mother. Uh, and so he supposed, and many scholars have, that women used these uh, sort of for, for good luck in the process of bearing children. So the mother goddess was the patroness of pregnant and nursing women. Next. Now, we have no actual finds from the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, this little ivory pomegranate, about the size of your thumb, was purchased by the Israel Museum some time ago. It, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, it even has a Hebrew inscription around the bottom, uh, which reads, set apart or sacred for the priest of the temple of, and the name of the deity is broken. But there's even worse to say. We now think the inscription is a modern forgery. The pomegranate is genuine, but some clever fellow uh, inscribed it and, and thereby made $600,000. So uh, I don't think it's a relic of the temple in Jerusalem, and we, we have to move on. Next. Here you see the reading. The reading is certain, but uh, I must say uh, that the, the uh, forger was very clever indeed. Um, somebody once said, well, only your professor, Frank Cross at Harvard, could actually have done this, and he said he didn't do it. So we don't know who did but he'll soon be in jail. Next. Now, another find from Jerusalem we might mention in passing was made uh, in a tomb in the garden of the St. Uh, Andrew's Scots Presbyterian Church in Jerusalem. And here you see a typical tomb of about 600 B.C., the last days of the Judean monarchy. Next. One of the most spectacular finds in the tomb was a pair of rolled up silver amulets. They were so brittle they couldn't be unrolled for a very long time, but eventually they were unrolled in the laboratory. And here you see one of these silver amulets at the right, uh, and then the Hebrew inscription to the left. Several things are important. First of all, this is the oldest surviving scrap of scripture. The, the Dead Sea Scrolls are not older than 200 BC. This is 600 BC. Why do I say scripture? Because it's the famous priestly blessing in number six. The Lord bless you, make his face to shine upon you, give you peace. But it's a slightly different version, which means there were several versions of this ancient prayer circulating besides the one we have in the Bible. Now, the other thing I think is important is nobody was reading this. It was rolled up and probably worn around somebody's neck. Either a man or a woman was, was wearing it. And you can imagine the priest would have said, you're supposed to read the Bible, not wear it. Uh, but this is the same thing you have in the custom of the mezuzah. You have a little bit of scripture uh, which you have rolled up. You're not actually reading it, but you place it on the door and you touch it as you go in and out. It's called a mezuzah. It's supposed to bring good luck. My wife put a mezuzah on the town post of our Lincoln car, but it didn't help. She totaled it anyway. <laughs> Next. So here again, you have the use already of scripture as magic, something that, that, that would have been highly unorthodox. Now let's move to the south. This is the site of a rod east of Beersheba, Beersheba uh, excavated by Israeli archaeologists in the 60s and 70s. And here we have another full-fledged temple, in fact, of the Israelite Judean period. Next. Here is a plan. It's a Judean fortress of a type that's well known to us. You see the corner towers, the double walls, and then look up the top, you see a, another three-roomed building. Next. Now, here in the outer court is an altar. This is kosher. According to the Bible, an altar should be built of unhewn stones. And here's what we have. So that's all right, except again, it shouldn't be here. It shouldn't be here at this site far from Jerusalem. Next.